The reading can be found on page 288 in your church Bibles. It may be worth getting them out because it's quite long and I'm likely to gallop. This is one of my children's favourite stories. Needless to say, I have a child called David. It is the story of David and Goliath. Page 288. Now the Philistines gathered their armies for battle, and they were gathered at Socho, which belongs to Judah, and encamped between Socho and Ezekiel in Ephesadam. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered and encamped in the valley of Elah, and drew up in the line of battle against Philistines. And the Philistines stood on the mountain on one side, and Israel stood on the mountain on the other side, with a valley between them. And there came out from the camp of the Philistines a champion named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. He had a helmet of bronze on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze, and he had bronze armour on his legs, and a javelin of bronze slung between his shoulders. The shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron, and his shield-bearer went before him. He stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why have you come out to draw up for battle? Am I not a Philistine, and you not servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves, and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistines said, I defy the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Now, David was the son of an Ephraite of Bethlehem in Judah, named Jesse who had eight sons. In the days of Saul, the man was already old and advancing in years. The three oldest sons of Jesse had followed Saul to the battle, and the names of his three sons who went to the battle were Eliab, the firstborn, and next to him, Abinadab, and the third, Shammah. David was the youngest. The three eldest followed Saul. But David went back and forth from Saul to feed his father's sheep in Bethlehem. For forty days the Philistine came forward and took his stand, morning and evening. And Jesse said to David his son, Take for your brothers an ephah of this parched grain and these ten loaves, and carry them quickly to the camp of your brothers. Also, Take these ten cheeses to the commander of their thousand. See if your brothers are well, and bring some token from them. Now Saul and they, and all the men of Israel, were in the valley of Elah, fighting with the Philistines. And David rose early in the morning, and left the sheep with the keeper, and took the provisions and went as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the encampment, as the house was going out, to the battle line, shouting the war cry. And Israel and the Philistines drew up for battle, army against army. And David left the things in charge of the keeper of the baggage and ran to the ranks and went and greeted his brothers. As he talked with them, behold, the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, came up out of the tanks of the Philistines and spoke the same words as before. And David heard him. All the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were much afraid. And the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel. And the king will enrich the man who kills him with great riches and will give him his daughter 
and make his father's house free in Israel. And David said to the men who stood by him, What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him in the same way, So shall it be done to the man who kills him. Now Eliab, his oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men. And Eliab's anger was kindled against David, and he said, Why have you come down? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your presumption and the evil of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. And David said, What have I done now? Was it not but a word? And he turned away from him towards another, and spoke in the same way. And the people answered him again as before. When the words that David spoke were heard, they repeated them before Saul, and he sent for him. And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, You are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are but a youth, and he has been a man of war from his youth. But David said to Saul, Your servant used to keep sheep for his father, and when there came a lion or a bear and took a lamb from the flock, I went after him and struck him and delivered it out of his mouth. And if he rose against me, I caught him by his beard and struck him and killed him. Your servant has struck down both lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them, for he has defied the armies of the living, living God. And David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. Then Saul clothed David with his armour. He put a helmet of bronze on his head and clothed him with a coat of mail. And David strapped his sword over his armour. And he tried in vain to go, for he had not tested them. Then David said to Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not tested them. So David put them off. Then he took his staff in his hand and chose five smooth stones from the book, from the brook, and put them in his shepherd's pouch. His sling was in his hand, and he approached the Philistine. And this Philistine moved forward and came near to David, with his shield bearer in front of him. And when the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth ruddy and handsome in appearance. And the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. The Philistine said to David, Come to me and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and to the beasts of the fields. Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down and cut off your head. And I will give the dead bodies of the host of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And that all this assembly may know that the Lord saves not with his sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hand. When the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David, David ran quickly towards the battle line to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag and took out a stone and slung it and struck the Philistine on his forehead. The stone sank into his forehead, and he fell on his face to the ground. <laughs> 
So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone, and struck the Philistine and killed him. There was no sword in the hand of David. Then David ran and stood over the Philistine and took his sword, and drew it out of his sheath, and killed him, and cut off his head with it. When the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. And the men of Israel and Judah rose with a shout and pursued the Philistines as far as Gap and the gates of Ekron, so that the wounded Philistines fell on the way from Sharon as far as Gap and Ekron. And the people of Israel came back from chasing the Philistines, and they plundered their camp. And David took the head of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem, but he put his armour in his tent. As soon as Saul saw David go out against the Philistine, he said to Abner, the commander of the army, Abner, whose son is this youth? And Abner said, As your soul lives, O king, I do not know. And the king said, Inquire whose son the boy is. And as soon as David returned from the striking down of the Philistine, Abner took him and brought him before Saul, with the head of the Philistine in his hand. And Saul said to him, Whose son are you, young man? And David answered, I am the son of your servant Jesse, the, the Bethlehemite. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, many thanks, Carol. I think at this point we should um, acknowledge our amazing readers at uh, our church who've been given quite a task this term of reading giant uh, chapters. Well, let's pray as we sit. Father, we thank you that your word is true. Help us now, Lord, to listen, to understand, and to obey what you have to say to us this morning for your glory. Amen. So, the story of David and Goliath, one of the most famous, fantastical, and feisty narratives in the Bible. And this ancient tale of David versus Goliath is still commonly spoken about, isn't it, in modern times, as a metaphor for anyone who takes on a giant. Of course, we love the underdog, the one that wins against all the odds. Whether it's a court battle, over the exclusive rights to branding, such as Microsoft versus the minnow, wait for this, Mike Rowe Soft, or Bentley Clothing against Bentley Car Cards, or what about the field of publishing? There was an unknown, divorced, penniless Scottish author, desperate to get her story published. She tried 12 giant publishers, all who ignored her until Bloomsbury finally, finally published her first novel, Harry and the Philosopher's Stone. Or what about Erin Brockenbridge, the inexperienced legal clerk and injured single mum who, mother of three, who won a class action suit against a big corporate giant who'd been contaminating her local area with carcinogens. Just some of the improbable victories of the underdog <coughs> So I wonder if that's what this chapter is all about. The little guy triumphing over the bully. A celebration of the underdog. An encouragement for us to stand up against our adversaries, however enormous. Well, I think if you're listening clearly, I think the writer wants to point us in a different direction. And there's a thread running through it, not primarily about the bravery of the underdog, but rather about the jealousy for the reputation of Israel, a jealousy for God's name. Because Goliath was literally trampling all over the kudos of God's chosen nation. Their street value had plummeted, the sponsors were leaving, their reputation was in tatters. Now if you were with us last week, one of the lessons was that God looks not at the external appearances, but at the heart. But of course, in the next chapter, the ability of the Israelites not to look at external 
um, appearances were being, was being tested to the max. They had become fixated on his appearance, this giant, and who could blame them? He was gigantic in every proportion. Goliath was the living embodiment of everything external appearances could offer. He literally loomed large in their eyes. You remember what we heard read, his height was six cubits and a span, a bronze helmet on his head, a coat of scale armour, his legs were bronze greaves and a bronze javelin. He was awe-inspiring and chilling and frightening. In comparison to Goliath, who stands and shouts to the Israelites each morning to herald his appearance, David, who appears on the scene, almost unnoticed. He creeps into the narrative. No fanfare, no DJ, no smoke, no fireworks. David was sent onto the battlefield by his dad to deliver packed lunch and snacks for his brothers. But as David arrives, in verse 23, the writer tells us that David heard. He heard the shouts of the giant. There's a wonderful line, isn't there, in the Christmas carol at a little town of Bethlehem about the arrival of Jesus. It says, how silently, how silently this wondrous gift is given. The hero Jesus also just slips into history, almost unnoticed. Well, firstly, I want us to notice the voice of faith, the voice of faith. So the question is raised, what will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? Well, not an unreasonable first question from David. What's in it for me? Is it worth the risk? David seems to be just weighing up his options. But David has more to say. He says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Up until this point, we haven't heard David say anything. He's been part of the story, but he's been silent. And therefore, his first words have great significance. And David brings a completely new perspective on the story. God's perspective. Up until now, God hasn't been part of the story. But now David does, God, and asks, doesn't having a living God make a difference in all this? This lanky fellow has mocked the ranks of the living God. Surely if God is so identified with Israel, surely he's not indifferent to the slurs on his reputation. Do you expect the living God to allow an uncircumcised Philistine to trample his name in military and theological mud? You see, the Israelite army, transfixed with external appearances, thought Goliath was invincible. But David sees for what he really is. He's uncircumcised. In other words, he's not marked out as one of God's people. Now is David just pressing the God button? Is he somehow rubbing the genie's lamp or using God as a magic charm? No. David is placing all his decisions, all his perspectives, in the realm of his knowledge that his God is a living God the voice of faith. Well, secondly, the vitality of faith. What does David have to deal with next? Well, it's his brothers, isn't it? And what did this brother say? Like any elder brother, Tristan, you've got some older brothers, and they say to you, why did you come down here? And with whom did you leave those few sheep in the desert? Why are you here, you irritating little brother? Does that ring true? So how does the brother respond, who's being nagged by his older brothers for what seems like forever? With a voice of exasperation. I don't know if you heard that in David's voice. Now what have I done? Can't I even speak? This is, of course, one of the many battles that David takes on this day. First, the contempt from his family for trying to muck, muck in at what's going on. Then he has to take on Saul, the battle of the mind games. Saul questions his ability to fight. You're only a boy. 
This Goliath, he's been a fighting man from his youth. But what is David's defence? Well, he paints his experience based on his work as a shepherd boy. Now, he's not faced giants, but which of us here would have the confidence to take on a lion or a bear? See, when that happens, David doesn't just go shrug and say, well, I'll keep my head down, there's plenty more sheep in this field. No, he went after the beasts. He would get stuck in, he would strike the ferocious animal, hoping it would release the poor defenceless sheep. And if it turned on him, in a scene like something from Tarzan, he would grab the beast by its hair, striking it and killing it. So for David, this Philistine is no different to the prey he had taken on as a shepherd boy. But where does David's confidence rest? Is it just his animal wrestling prowess? Look at verse 37. He says, The Lord, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will deliver me in the hand of this Philistine. Listen to the point David's making. His boast about his daring feats as a shepherd boy are not really about his own strength or skills or ninja moves. He recognises that it is the Lord who has delivered him from the paw of the lion or the bear. And therefore he has confidence that even a giant would not stand in the way of the Lord. Because he wasn't looking at outward appearances. He knew Goliath's heart wasn't of God. The underdog knew he was under God's protection. He was under God, not an under God, a dog. He was under God, not an underdog. See, David's faith is based on what God has done in the past that gives him confidence for the tasks in the present. God has delivered me before. God is more than able to deliver me today. Therefore, he will deliver me. Of course, this should be true of us. We have even more history to look back on than David did. Our God is the God who gets the job done. He's rescued the guilty. He is the God who rescued me on the cross. He is the God who, whose rescue carries me through to heaven as my life is now hidden in Christ. Whether our foe is a lion, a bear, or a giant, we can be confident in our God. Listen to what Paul wrote in Romans. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, neither the present nor future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation, will be able to separate me from the love of of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. You see, in David's eyes, the battle was not David versus Goliath, but rather Goliath versus God. And in that battle, even Goliath is the underdog. Do you remember the words of the Magnificat that Mary sang when she was told she would bear a child. She said of God, He has put down the mighty from their thrones and exalted the lowly. What a God we have. Well, next, the victory of faith. Finally, we get to the battle scene and Goliath does not disappoint. He presses right up against David. He uses all his physical presence to dominate and to intimidate David. David! Am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? Well, you can imagine the onlookers, can't you? Oh dear, another one about to strike the dust. Parents cover up the eyes of their children. Look away now, hide behind your cushion. Carnage awaits. But before the first blow is struck, cue the brave heart speaks from David. He says this, You, Goliath, come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. And David himself doesn't mind a bit of fighting talk. Today, Goliath, 
I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds of the air. What a story. Go, David! But again, what is David's motivation? That the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. See, for David, the choice of weapon is of no concern. Rather, the flag flying over the camp. You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty. And more than that, the victory is given despite our human weakness. David could only muster up a slingshot and a stone. He even had to borrow a sword to finish off the giant. You see, the world saw David as weak. His brothers, you're a pain. Saul, you're green. And Goliath, you're puny. David doesn't even have the right equipment of a soldier. It's too big for him, isn't it? And so he mocks Goliath's symbols of strength. And yet God gives the victory despite the symbols of man's strength. You see, the key determinant of victory is not your top trump ranking, but whether or not the Lord is on your side. Don't we see this again and again in the Bible? The fact that our inadequacies are often the CV requirement for being in God's employment. He works through our weaknesses. Well, finally, the vision of faith. Throughout this chapter, Israel, its armies and any new recruit, in this case David, has been the subject of mocking and of taunting. And David recognised this, that's what he heard. And that was his primary motivation, to restore the honour of his God. God's reputation, his glory was at stake. See, that's why this chapter is not primarily about the little guy being brave, the triumph of the underdog. No, it's a message about God's ability in the face of our inability. The glory is not David's, but the Lord's. Yes, we can marvel at David's faith, but don't lose sight of his motivation. He was prepared to be fed to the birds in order to save his God's name. Well, early this year, columns of tanks amassed on the outskirts of the Ukrainian capital, Kiev. A Russian Goliath this time, far mightier with more military resources that loomed large over the besieged city. Brave reporters gave live broadcasts to the world's media from bunker positions. How would the Ukrainian David respond? Well, enter centre stage the also rather diminutive President Zelensky. Like David, he can also put on the fighting talk. He said, we will not forgive, we will not forget, we will punish everyone who committed atrocities in this war. We will find every scum who was shelling our cities, our people who were shooting the missiles, who was giving orders. You will not have a quiet place on this earth except for a grave. But like David, he stirs up the jealousy of the pride and freedom and reputation of his nation. He says, we will fight till the end at sea in the air. And in front of the Ukrainian flag, we will fight in the forest, in the fields, on the shores, and in the streets. And what is their cry? Slava Ukraini. Glory to Ukraine. Well, what are the situations where we see God's name under threat? Does it matter more to us than our own reputation or our safety or our comfort? When are we tempted to be silent, to walk on by, to compromise, to spectate rather than to participate? It's likely it's going to be in small things rather than giants, small decisions that need to be costly, painful, but where God's honour is put above all else. So let us glory in his name, his reputation, as our motivation for life. Let us show the world that we live under the flag of the Lord Jesus.
And let us not fear the Goliaths, for our God is more than able. Amen. Well, we're going to uh, respond to that now in singing two songs.